So as we pick up on part two of chapter three, Rodolfo is singing while his uncle plays the guitar. Rodolfo's tenor, round and full, and so beautiful, that Naftali's eyes filled with tears. Uncle Orlando finished the song with several resounding chords to accompany Rodolfo's last long note. Rodolfo took off a hat and swept it in a great arc. As he bowed, Mamadre and Lorita rushed to hug him. B -b Bravo! yelled Naftali. Naftali could not remember if he had ever seen Rodolfo or Lorita so happy. Or the last time he had heard Mamadre laugh out loud. He ran to his family and threw his arms around them, wanting this elation to last forever. But all too soon, Mamadre's body grew rigid. She raised a hand and tilted her head to one side. No one spoke as they listened for what Mamadre had heard. There it was. A faint train whistle. Although any number of trains passed through Temuco every day, she always knew the sound of fathers. Her smile faded. Neftali watched Rodolfo's face drain. Do not worry, said Mamadre. The train is not yet near. Now quickly, they all scrambled. Rodolfo and Uncle Orlando replaced the contents of the trunk. Lorita hurried to collect the cups, cups and saucers. But her hand trembled so much that a cup fell to the floor and shattered. She began to cry. Neftali rushed to her. It is all right, Lorita. You p p pull the blankets back to the bedrooms. I will pick up the pieces. Wide-eyed, Lorita sniffled. But, but... If Father notices, I will say that I dropped it, said Neftali. She swiped an arm across her tears, gave him a sweet smile, and began gathering the blankets. Meanwhile, Mamadre glided from one preparation to another. From the kitchen... Tablecloth to the dining room. From the cabinet for candelabras to the table... Attentive and methodical, she folded napkins and set out glasses and plates without saying a word. After Neftali cleaned up the cups and saucers, he rushed to help Rodolfo and Uncle Orlando carry extra chairs to the table. He already dreaded all of the adults who might look him in the eye and ask him questions. How m -m 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 many chairs? Mamadre answered without looking. Twelve at least. If Father does not bring home that many guests, he will fill every place with strangers from the street. Comb your hair. Wash your hands. I must go and warm las empanadas y el bistec. Neftali's mouth watered at the suggestion of the potato turnovers and of the steak smothered with onions. He hoped they would fill up the empty feeling that he had overcome him at the sound of the train whistle. The feeling that he had suddenly lost something. He watched Mamadre turn and walk to the kitchen, her face now wan and preoccupied. What had happened to her laughter and twinkling eyes and flushed cheeks? Where had Mamadre buried them? Within the hour, Father's boots pounded on the floorboards. His big voice filled the house. Aquí estoy! I am here! He blew the conductor's whistle. Neftali, Rodolfo, and Lorita rushed to stand in front of him. They held their hands flat and then turned their palms up for inspection. Neftali's were still pink and from his vigorous scrubbing. Satisfactory, Father nodded and then headed toward the dining room. The door opened again and men began to flood into the house. Rail, ra railroad workers, 
shopkeepers, even a traveling merchant who had been waylaid overnight in Temuco. Father poured drinks from the sideboard and assigned everyone a seat. Neftali sat in his chair with his best posture and studied his plate, avoiding any of the guests' eyes. He pushed the tablecloth aside and looked longingly underneath. If only he could escape to the shadowy company of boots. Father sat at the head of the table, jovial and generous to his guests, passing around stories as easily as he passed around el pan amasado, the homemade bread. He told tales about Beteron horses, Pumas in the wild, and the Mapuche Indians. What is the current situation with Mapuche? asked the merchant. We are trying to move them out of the area, said the shopkeeper, but many will not listen. These are difficult times for those of us who are trying to develop the land and make a nice community here in Temuco. Uncle Orlando cleared his throat. The Mapuche have lived here for hundreds of years. Why should they leave their homeland? He had a fire in his belly and a determination in his eyes. Neftali admired how his uncle never had a problem speaking out about what he thought was right or wrong. Would Neftali ever have confidence to do the same? Their presence is undesirable, said the shopkeeper. They do not want to conform to the ways of the townspeople. The Mapuche can't even read. The shopkeepers must put up a sign shaped like a giant shoe above the shoe store and a sign shaped like a giant hammer above the hardware store, a giant key for the locksmith. It is absurd. And all this so they will know which building is which? That was true, thought Neftali. He had seen those very signs. The giant shoe was his favorite. And what is wrong with that? asked Uncle Orlando. Why do we not learn a little of their language? We did come to their land. Why should they think as we think? Why should they give up everything they have known for generations? Neftali considered Uncle Orlando's words. He could not imagine being 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 pushed from his own home without his books and his collections, not to mention leaving his school in the river Cowton. His eyes followed the conversation from one man to the other. Their voices grew sharper with each response. It is progress, said the shopkeeper. For me it is business, nothing more, nothing less. Nothing less than greed, said Uncle Orlando. Your thinking is as thick as the mud. Wait a moment, said the shopkeeper, studying Uncle Orlando. I know who you are. You are the one who owns La Mañana, the newspaper that publishes all the ar articles in favor of the Mapuche. Uncle Orlando stood up. Neftali's eyes grew wide with fear. The shopkeeper was much larger than Uncle Orlando. Gentlemen, this is a family dinner, said Father. We will discuss the Mapuche at a more appropriate time. Uncle Orlando sat down and folded his arms across his chest. The shopkeeper spared his meat with his fork and ate it. He chewed vigorously, his eyes darting from one person to the next. No one said a word. Mamadre rose from the table. Her chair scraped the floor, breaking the uncomfortable silence. Father pointed at one of his workers. Tell the children about the beetle you found yesterday. Neftali sat up a little straighter and strained to hear. I found it on a luma tree. It looked like a living jewel wearing many fantastic colors. Pink, green, purple, and silver. And when I tried to catch the thing, it zipped away. One moment it was there, and the next, poof. He nodded at Naftali. Young man, have you ever been into the forest? All eyes turned to Naftali. 
He knew he must answer when an adult spoke to him, but his skin felt as if it were tightening and blood rushed to his cheeks. The word could not escape. He tried again. Father shifted in his chair. His face reddened. Do not pay attention to him. He is absent-minded, and he spends so much time in idle thought, he can barely speak. There's no telling what will become of him. Neftali saw it with his eyes down, paralyzed. Was he breathing? He could not tell. There is nothing wrong with a little idle thought, said Uncle Orlando. And perhaps he needs the athletic outdoors and a trip to the great forest where he can focus on what is real, this beautiful land and its people, before a developer tries to change it. He glanced at Natale. Nephew, you would like that, would you not? Neftali lifted his eyes slightly and nodded. Father grunted. Maybe next year, when he is not so feeble, he turned to Mamadre. Let us take coffee. Children, you are excused. Grateful to be released, Neftali slid from his chair and ran to his room. There, with the muffled voices of the grown-ups in the background, he paused before his collections. He straightened the rows of rocks, twigs, and nests, touching each item as if taking attendance. Father's words word echoed. Absent-minded. Absent-minded. It did not make sense. How could he be absent-minded when his head was so crowded with thoughts? He opened the drawer and unfolded each piece of paper he had saved. Then he read the words, mouthing each one perfectly. Before he replaced them, he added one more. Luma. Later, as he lay in bed, Neftali tried to imagine the beetle on the luma tree. The one that looked like a living jewel and could disappear in the blink of an eye. Father's words haunted him. Neftali wished that time would disappear as fast as a colorful beetle in one poof so he too could discover what would become of him. What is the color of a minute, a month, a year? I am poetry lurking in dappled shadow. I am the confusion of root and gnarled branch. I am the symmetry of insect, leaf, and a bird's outstretched wings.